history here, you find we have a tendency to want to come together. For the first time, we have a tendency to want to work together. And up to now, no organization on the American continent has tried to unite you and me with our brothers and sisters back home. At no time, none of us. Marcus Garvey did it, they put him in jail. They framed him, the government. Framed him, put him in jail. Marcus Garvey tried. A first step to tackle discrimination is to listen to the experiences of those who have been marginalized. We believe and we hope that this meeting will allow us to share experiences and best practices to see where we can learn from each other in our attempts to do better. The definition of racial discrimination in that convention, which talks about racism on purpose or in effect, I think is very relevant for your discussions. Recognition is reparation. Recognition is reconciliation. And recognition is healing. We encourage states who have not celebrated the launch of the International Decade to do so as part of educating their populations and bringing awareness on the importance of the International Decade. first commemoration of the International Day for Persons of African Descent. Today is a day to reaffirm that the abolition of slavery did not end stigmatization and differential treatment and exclusion of persons of African descent. Greetings. I'd like to speak with you about the history and significance of the August 31st International Day of Our Race. Established August 1920, during the first International Convention of the Negro Peoples of the World, convened by the right excellent Marcus Garvey, the holiday was adopted to celebrate the successful ratification of the Declaration of the Rights of Negro Peoples of the World a declaration of independence that openly expressed the nationalistic aspirations of our race and intention to control our own destiny. The red, black, and green flag and its anthem were also adopted at this convention that marked the first time the Negroes of the world, represented through 25,000 delegates from 40 countries, ever formed a plebiscite to establish a provisional government and elect a representative to champion our rights and petition the nations of the world to respect them. Now I turn to the question of whether Marcus Garvey and the UNIA and the Declaration of 1920 New York, the Declaration of the Rights of uh, Negro Peoples of the World had any bearing on the creation and designation of August 31. And my answer is absolutely yes. Last year, the General Assembly of the United Nations declared August 31 as the International Day for People of African Descent. It was actually created by the United Nations to celebrate the diverse heritage and contributions of people of African descent. August 31 was thought to be a fitting day because it was in August 31, 1920, that the rights of people of African descent was adopted in New York. So it is very important to mark this day. And in view of the fact that I was chair of the working group of experts on people of African descent, when the program of activities for the IDPAD was drafted, I did play a role, um, however marginal, in, in this day, in the declaration of this day. But others played a more important role in actually getting the day, August 31, adopted and declared. In fact, when the day was declared and adopted last year, 
in the General Assembly. It was under the initiative of Costa Rican former, pri former um, Vice President Epsi Bar Campbell or Epsi Campbell Bar. The time has come to inspire the people. The time has come to open the doors that defeat fear, to grow, to create more participation by the people. Her name is Epsi Campbell, and she's one of nearly 75,000 black African descendants living in the Central American country of Costa Rica. I'm part of a group who have to work centuries to be recognized as a human. I'm part of a group who fight a lot to develop their country and the country deny them. This denial, she says, is one reason she's taking a major step, seeking her party's nomination to run for president of the country. My voice is not only my voice is the voice of the people that don't have any opportunity. I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about the life of millions of people who need people like me in the first line. And helping in the struggle are people like Laura Wilson, a former housewife who's now using her position as a local municipal leader to teach children about their Afro identity and to speak to the government about their needs. What we have to do is get together, go to our people, go to our communities. We have to call the government, we have to sit them down. We have to sit down with each political party at the table. And that's what we have to do. We have to get aggressive. We are facing a change in, in this country. We are working for a new society. This is the reason of my fight, and this is the reason of my life. Why she became the first um, vice president, woman vice president in Latin America, she had a leadership in the party that she belonged to, and that in her leadership in the, in the country, that she made it, and was postulated to be vice president and that group went out. So it was a great thing for us because I feel that we as a black community in Costa Rica felt very good about our nomination and our election. It was good to have that experience and to the recognition of black people here in Costa Rica. Hola, soy Epsi Campbell, vicepresidenta de Costa Rica. Como gobierno de Costa Rica presentamos ante la Asamblea General de las Naciones Unidas un proyecto de resolución para proclamar el 31 de agosto como el Día Internacional de los Pueblos Afrodescendientes, una fecha que nos permitirá reconocer los extraordinarios aportes e incansables luchas por construir sociedades inclusivas y justas. Las negociaciones lideradas por la Misión Permanente de Costa Rica ante las Naciones Unidas en Nueva York han sido exitosas y han logrado sumar a países como copatrocinadores, convirtiéndose muy pronto este compromiso en una realidad que contribuirá con el reconocimiento de millones de afrodescendientes en todo el mundo. Costa Rica es parte de una larga historia. Hoy tomamos la estafeta junto a otros países para conmemorar los aportes de millones de personas afrodescendientes. Es una acción para el futuro y un tributo para líderes del pasado, porque hace exactamente 100 años se celebró en la ciudad de Nueva York, donde hoy precisamente tiene sede las Naciones Unidas, la primera convención internacional de los pueblos negros del mundo. Las extraordinarias discusiones lideradas por Marcus Garvey, hoy héroe nacional de Jamaica, y uno de los primeros panafricanistas, con miles de delegados de diferentes países, terminaron en la adopción de la Declaración de los Derechos de los Pueblos Negros del Mundo, que estableció en su artículo 53 la proclamación del 31 de agosto de cada año como Día Internacional de los Pueblos Negros, fecha que por fin adoptaremos como un compromiso con la Agenda de los Pueblos Afrodescendientes en la mitad del decenio. 
Esta fue una de las declaraciones de derechos humanos más notables del siglo XX, que hizo explícitos los derechos a la justicia racial, la igualdad ante la ley, el derecho a la autodeterminación, la libertad de prensa, la libertad de culto religioso, el derecho a una educación ilimitada y sin prejuicios para nosotros y una prosperidad para siempre, así como el derecho a la paz antes de la Declaración Universal de los Derechos Humanos. The UNIA, the Branch 300 here in Limón, Costa Rica, have been always celebrating the 31st of August from the declaration stated it, I declare it, decreed that the 31st of August will be an holiday for all Negro in the world. Here, as I mentioned before, Marcos Gary has a strong position here in Limón, so through that we have been keeping and setting up this um, 31st of August to be uh, a big celebration for Limón and through the liberty we have in Limón, it has been the one who always kept this activity, so uh, it, it gets stronger and stronger every day and now it's much stronger than before. We have been looking in Costa Rica about the 31st of August that have, um, let us say, with, as move on because nationally they would have decreed that from 1980 that in, Limon, in Costa Rica celebrate New Year's Day. Then we come up with a law in 9526 that says that from the 1st of August until the 31st of August will be the celebration of Negro's Day in Costa Rica. We see we have the, the, the legislators in the Congress have stepped up to recognize the, 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 the support and the apport that we have done in Costa Rica and that's why we have the celebration that it even passed forward that our um, Vice President took it to the United Nations to approve it but I still feel they don't do it. And the UNIA did it in 1920. They say it's an holiday to observe by all Negroes in the world. And we need to have it as an holiday paid by the government in each country, especially in Costa Rica. International Day celebrations, in any, in any case, invite government, civil society, the public, and private sectors, schools and universities, and generally citizens of the world to reflect on values that unite humanity and to take concrete actions to advance them. In proclaiming August 31 as the International Day for People of African Descent, the international community is recognizing that people of African descent represent a distinct group whose human rights must be promoted and protected. One of the most significant and distinguished accomplishments of Marcus Garvey and the Universal Negro Improvement Association, and one that is often underscored, is the fact that Garvey elevated the issues that confronted the black race at his time, during his time, from a civil rights issue to a human rights issue. And he did this by pursuing the international body that became the United Nations but started out as the League of Nations relentlessly between the years of 1919 and 1945. The UNIA sent several delegations to the League of Nations. The first led by Eliezer Kadea Haitian in 1919. A second delegation which included Jean John Adams, another Haitian in 1922. Garvey himself traveled to Geneva, Switzerland in 1928, where he himself presented the petition in person to the Secretary General of the League of Nations at the time, Sir Eric Drummond. The year was 1920 and World War I was coming to an end. Many countries were sick of fighting and wanted there to be lasting peace worldwide. If all of these countries agreed on the same thing, it might be a good idea to form a group or club, right? This is when the League of Nations was born. 
The League of Nations included 63 countries from every continent in the world joined together to promote peace. They had a goal of settling disagreements through meetings instead of wars. Their covenant stated their goal was preventing wars through collective security and disarmament and settling international disputes through negotiation and arbitration. The League of Nations also had a goal of improving civil rights around the world like labor conditions, human trafficking, treatment of native inhabitants, prisoners of war, and global health. The League was a way of checking up on one another and making sure people around the world had a better quality of life. The League of Nations would also mediate talks about territorial disputes. Often countries couldn't agree on where their borders were and what areas of land they owned, especially islands. The League of Nations worked to settle these disputes peacefully. The League of Nations lasted until 1946. At this point, it disbanded and the United Nations was formed, which still exists today. As soon as the League of Nations is formed, Garvey challenges their commitment to real and lasting world peace by confronting them with the plight of people of African descent in the world at that time. His petition spoke to the rights of people of African descent to self-determination, to the decolonization of Africa, to the economic and industrial advancement of Africa, as well as equal opportunities and rights when it came to education and travel for people of African descent. He even condemned the emergence of apartheid laws in South Africa, which had begun six years prior. Garvey's petition threatens to expose the violation of the human rights of people of African descent internationally, and it causes a panic. The United States Bureau of Investigation puts him on their radar, and the League of Nations refuses to receive his representative in the person of Eliezer Cadet. They give the excuse that the UNIA does not constitute a nation state. In response, Garvey gives them a final warning about legislating world policy without consulting the millions of persons of color and of African descent in the world. And when the European press refuses to publish the petition and these international concerns, Garvey calls for an international convention of his own in 1920 at which he makes a declaration of rights for the people of African descent. One of the articles declares the League of Nations null and void. Following this convention, with the backing of 400 million Negroes, Marcus Garvey began to address the intergovernmental bodies, like the International Conference on Naval Limitation in 1921, where he warned the conferees about, quote, the awful mistake of legislating for the disposition of other people's land, especially Africa, without taking them into consideration. He reminded them that there can be no peace without an inclusion in that peace of the freedom and liberty of 400 million Negroes of the world. In 1922, the UNIA dispatched a delegation to the League of Nations General Assembly petitioning the body to cede the former German colonies in Africa to our provisional government. This delegation became the first black non-state member delegation to be seated and heard before the assembly. By 1928, Mr. Garvey personally visited the League of Nations, continuing his advocacy for African self-determination and respect for our human rights internationally. At the 1945 founding convention of the United Nations in San Francisco, the Honorable UNIA International Organizer, William LeVan Sherrill, attended and delivered a renewal of the original UNIA petition, while the Honorable Amy Jakes Garvey forwarded her memorandum correlative of Africa, the West Indies, and the Americas to the same. As the fight for self-determination for Africans at home and abroad raged on, and African nations began winning their independence. Succeeding generations continued to wave the red, black, and green flag and celebrate the August 31st International Day for our race. Last year, the United Nations officially recognized this observance and formally declared August 31st International Day for People of African Descent, a day to promote the extraordinary contributions of the Africans at home and abroad, to celebrate our heritage, and condemn racism in all its forms. Greetings. 
My name is Natisha Bohart Singh, and I am a member of the 2020 cohort of the United Nations Fellowship Program for People of African Descent. And today, I join with my home country, Jamaica, and the global family to celebrate this International Day for People of African Descent. As a student of law, history, and culture, it would be remiss of me to not highlight the ancestral alignments that have brought us to this space. This day, August 31st, also coincides with the first international convention of the Negro peoples of the world. And as a result of the discussions led by Jamaica's first national hero, the right excellent Marcus Messiah Garvey, the declarations of the rights of the Negro peoples of the world was promulgated on August 31st, 1920. Today, I applaud the United Nations for finally proclaiming 31st August as the International Day for People of African Descent in order to further promote greater respect and recognition for the diverse heritage, culture, and contribution of the people of African descent to the development of societies and to promote greater respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms for our 